would have been one hell of a spectacular sight of that world on top of those. You'll see how much erosion has taken place from here down to here in the last 13,000 years. The joints down here, these vertical cracks, are called grikes, and these bits in between are called clints. This is sandstone, and sand itself is pure quartz, and quartz is pretty much chemically inert. It's very, very stable, so very little will dissolve that, that quartz. Now, there's the argument sometimes that the grains of sand have to be held together in some way, and geologists have a term for the material that holds it together, and we call it cement. Um, it's not obviously cement that you use in buildings, it's cement that's made up of some kind of mineral. And it can be various things, it can be iron, and if it was iron the sand would be red. Um, it could be um, more quartz, it could be like a silica cement, or it could be something like calcite. And calcite is what's in the limestones. So we all know that limestones are soluble in slightly acidic water. So we have been up here just to see if it is calcite, because if it was calcite it would dissolve and you might mm. get some kind of feature like that naturally. So the one way you can test that is to bring up hydrochloric acid. And we have been up and there's no reaction whatsoever. So we know the sandstones are held together with a quartz cement. So it is all quartz, it's all silica, therefore it doesn't dissolve. It's an example of, of, of lithic percussion marks, pecking, which and, and causing the grooves and uh, the ridges kind of thing. What we call the druid chair. So sit in and take a photo. It is a wedge grave. It's one of the finest preserved wedge graves. This grave is, is facing directly into the setting sun. With two chambers, portico and a big chamber. It's constructed of sandstone except for one slab of limestone and another slab of limestone at the end. It is a classic example of balanced construction. If you look there, the front chamber, you will see all the side stones or the outer sands carefully worked. With rough stones. If you look at the back, it is the opposite. With rough kind of cobblestones as the side wall, the walls, and nice cut, smoothed stones on top. If you look carefully at the dividing stone between the two, you'll see that the far side of it has been cut and smoothed, whereas this side is rough and weathered. Okay. So that was retained right throughout this kind of duality, balance between what's worked and what is rough. The limestone and the sandstone probably would have a far greater colour contrast in prehistoric times, so this would have stood out at the entrance, and the worked stone would have stood out in contrast to the weathered stone as well. If you look here, we have perfect examples of lithic, lithic percussion marks. The marks left by the stone implement on the stone. It's situated behind it is what's called the giant's leap. There's a story in folklore about giants challenging one another to a contest to jump. One was a little bit unlucky after being tripped up, and so we buried here, and the other had went off in the fires, which was the young giantess. Right? And this poor flecker that died is buried. <laughs> you see many. Uh, Examples of rock art, cup and ring. Okay, tell us how it's quickly. Which is older than the wedge grave. In fact, archaeologists say that these were the first of the megalithic tombs that were constructed, dating to about 3,500, 4,000 BC. So anything from five and a half to 6,000 years old. I think the back of it is the front of it, if you know what I mean. Let's go round the back front. Would have rested originally, and it would have been one hell of a spectacular sight of that were on top of those features. It's unusual, though, that you have them this way. Usually, they're that way. I just want to see if the folks are still around here. So I'm going to. Hello, are you there? They are. They're still there. There's the sandstone um, on the top, and limestone on the bottom. Now, what often happens? is that the boulders are dumped on top of, say, boulder clay. What's happened in this case is the boulders being dumped directly on top of limestone. Crinoids, which are sometimes called sea lilies, there's little bits of broken up coral shell, and there's little bits of, of creatures that we call bryozoan, a little bit like a fish net in there. But all those creatures 
um, you only find in a marine environment, which is how we know there was a shallow tropical sea that this limestone was deposited in. Now, in this wee bit over here, it's a nibbled pine cone. There's only one creature that nibbles it like that. It's a red squirrel. More importantly, a red squirrel, yeah. So we know we have them in this forest. Which is, although people might give off about coniferous forests, it's one good thing about them. Well, actually, there's two good things about them here. One is that they've protected a lot of these monuments. But although they might not have been the most sympathetically planted trees in the world, it has stopped people coming up here. And if it wasn't for that, who knows what would have happened to a lot of these monuments in here. And they're also home to red squirrels, which, as we all know, were being sort of pushed out by the grey squirrel. They are. They're still there. 